I'm Jimmy Floyd. Welcome to TED Talks in NYC, the series that brings TED.com celebrated conversations to television and keeps the conversation going with some of the brightest minds in New York City. This week's show is all about bugs, as in food. You heard me right, eating bugs. Now let's get right into it with ecological entomologist Marcel Dica. In his 2010 TED Global Talk, he makes a convincing case for adding insects to our diet. Don't be squeamish. It's good stuff. If you stick around, you may just be persuaded. Okay, I'm going to show you again something about our diets. And I would like to know what the audience is. And so, who of you ever ate insects? That's quite a lot. <laughs> But still, you're not representing the overall population of the Earth. <laughs> Because there's 80% out there that really eats insects. But this is quite good. Why not eat insects? Well, first, what are insects? Insects are animals that walk around on six legs. And here you see just a selection. There are six million species of insects on this planet. Six million species. There's a few hundreds of mammals, six million species of insects. In fact, if we count all the individual organisms, we would come at much larger numbers. In fact, of all animals on Earth, of all animal species, 80% walks on six legs. But if we would count all the individuals, and we take an average weight of them, it would amount to something like 200 to 2,000 kilograms for each of you and me on Earth. That means that in terms of biomass, insects are more abundant than we are. And we're not on a planet of man, but we're on a planet of insects. Insects are not only there in nature, but they also are involved in our economy, usually without us knowing. There was an estimation, a conservative estimation, a couple of years ago, that the US economy benefited by $57 billion dollars per year. It's a number, very large. A contribution to the economy of the United States for free. And so I looked up what the economy was paying for the war in Iraq in the same year. That was 80 billion US dollars. Well, we know that that was not a cheap war. So insects, just for free, contribute to the economy of the United States with about the same order of magnitude, just for free, without everyone knowing. And not only in the States, but in any country, in any economy. What do they do? They remove dung, they pollinate our crops. A third of all the fruits that we eat are all a result of insects taking care of the reproduction of plants. They control pests and they're food for animals. They're at the start of food chains. Small animals eat insects, even larger animals eat insects, but the small animals that eat insects are being eaten by larger animals, still larger animals, and at the end of the food chain, we are eating them as well. There's quite a lot of people that are eating insects. And here you see me in a small provincial town in China, Lijiang, about two million inhabitants. If you go out for dinner, like in a fish restaurant where you can select which fish you want to eat, you can select which insects you would like to eat. And they prepare it in a wonderful way. And here you see me enjoying a meal with caterpillars, locusts, bee, goopy delicacies. And you can eat something new every day. There's more than 1,000 species of insects that are being eaten all around the globe. That's quite a bit more than just a few mammals that, that we're eating, like a cow or a pig or a sheep. More than 1,000 species. An enormous variety. And now you may think, okay, in this provincial town in China, they're doing that, but not we. Well, we've seen already that quite some of you already ate insects, maybe occasionally. But I can tell you that every one of you is eating insects, without any exception. You're eating at least 500 grams per year. What are you eating? Tomato soup, peanut butter, chocolate, noodles, 
any processed food that you're eating contains insects. Because insects are here all around us. And when they're out there in nature, they're also in our crops. As some fruits get some insect uh, damage. Those are the fruits, if they're tomato, that go to the tomato soup. If they don't have any damage, they go to the grocery. And that's your view of a tomato. But there's tomatoes that end up in the soup. And as long as they meet the requirements of the food agency, there can be all kinds of things in there, no problem. In fact, why would we put these balls in the soup? There's meat in there anyway. <laughs> in fact, all our processed foods contain more proteins than we would be aware of. So anything is a good protein source already. Now you may say, okay, so we're eating 500 grams just by accident. We're even doing this on purpose in a lot of food items that we have. I have only two items here on the slide. Pink cookies or surimi sticks, or if you like, Campari. A lot of our food products that are of a red color are dyed with a natural dye. The surimi sticks is crab meat, or it's being sold as crab meat. It's white fish that's being dyed with cochineal. And cochineal is a product of an insect that lives of these cacti. It's being produced in large amounts, 150 to 180 metric tons per year, in the Canary Islands, in Peru, and it's big business. One gram of cochineal costs about 30 euros. One gram of gold is 30 euros. So it's a very precious thing that we're using to dye our foods. Now, the situation in the world is going to change for you and me, for everyone on this earth. The human population is growing very rapidly and is growing exponentially. Where at the moment we have something between six and seven billion people, it will grow to about nine billion in 2050. That means that we have a lot more mouths to feed. And this is something that worries more and more people. There was an FAO conference last October that was completely devoted to this. How are we going to feed this world? And if you look at the figures up there, it says that we have a third more mouths to feed, but we need agricultural production increase of 70%. And that's especially because this world population is increasing, and it's increasing not only in numbers, but we're also getting wealthier. And anyone that gets wealthier starts to eat more and also starts to eat more meat. And meat, in fact, is something that costs a lot of our agricultural production. Our diet consists for some part of animal proteins. And at the moment, most of us here get it from livestock, from fish, from game. And we're eating quite a lot of it. In the developed world, it's on average 80 kilograms per person per year, which goes up to 120 in the United States and a bit lower in some other countries, but on average 80 kilograms per person per year. In the developing world, it's much lower. It's 25 kilograms per person per year, but it's increasing enormously. In China, in the last 20 years, it increased from 20 to 50. And it's still increasing. So if a third of the world population is going to increase its meat consumption from 25 to 80 on average, and a third of the world population is living in China and in India, we're having an enormous demand on meat. And of course, we are not there to say, well, that's only for us, it's not for them. They have the same share that we have. Now, to start with, I should say that we are eating way too much meat in the Western world. We could do with much, much less. And I know I've been a vegetarian for a long time, and you can easily do without anything. You'll get proteins in any kind of food anyway. But then, there's a lot of problems that come with meat production, and we're being faced with that more and more often. The first problem that we're facing is human health. Pigs are quite like us. They're even models in medicine, and we can even transplant organs from a pig to a human. That means that pigs also share diseases with us. And in a pig, a pig disease, a pig virus, and a human virus can both proliferate and because of their kind of reproduction, they can combine and produce a new virus. This has happened in the Netherlands in the 1990s during the classical swine fever. 
outbreak. You get a new disease that can be deadly. When you eat insects, they're so distantly related from us that this doesn't happen. So that's one point for insects. <laughs> and there's the conversion factor. If you take 10 kilograms of feed, you can get one kilogram of beef, but you can get nine kilograms of locust meat. So if you would be an entrepreneur, what would you do? With 10 kilograms of input, you can get either one or nine kilograms of output. So far, we're taking the one or up to five kilograms of output. We're not taking the bonus yet. We're not taking the nine kilograms of output yet. So that's two points for insects. Then there's the environment. If we take 10 kilograms of food <laughs> and it results in one kilogram of beef, the other nine kilograms are waste. And a lot of that is manure. If you produce insects, you have less manure per kilogram of meat that you produce. So less waste. Furthermore, per kilogram of manure, you have much, much less ammonia and fewer greenhouse gases when you have insect manure than when you have cow manure. So you have less waste, and the waste that you have is not as environmentally malign as it is with cow dung. So that's three points for insects. <laughs> now there's a big if, of course, and it is if insects produce meat that is of good quality. Well, there have been all kinds of analyses, and in terms of protein, of fat, of vitamins, it's very good. In fact, it's comparable to anything that we eat as meat at the moment. And even in terms of calories, it's very good. One kilogram of grasshoppers has the same amount of calories as 10 hot dogs or six Big Macs. So that's four points for insects. <laughs> I can go on. I could make many more points for insects, but time doesn't allow this. So the question is, why not eat insects? I gave you at least four arguments in favor. We'll have to. Even if you don't like it, you'll have to get used to this. Because at the moment, 70% of all our agricultural land is being used to produce livestock. That's not only the land where the livestock is walking and feeding, but it's also other areas where the feed is being produced and being transported. We can increase it a bit at the expense of rainforests. But there's a limitation very soon. And if you remember that we need to increase agricultural production by 70%, we're not going to make it that way. We could much better change from meat, from, from beef, to insects. And then 80% of the world already eats insects. So we're just a minority in a country like the UK, the USA, the Netherlands, anywhere. On the left-hand side, you see a market in Laos where they have abundantly present all kinds of insects that you can choose for dinner, for the night. On the right-hand side, you see a grasshopper. And so people there are eating them, not because they're hungry, but because they think it's a delicacy. It's just very good food. You can vary enormously, and has many benefits. In fact, we have delicacy that's very much like this grasshopper. Shrimps, a delicacy being sold at a high price. Who wouldn't like to eat a shrimp? There are a few people that don't like shrimp, but shrimp or crabs or crayfish, it's very closely related. There are delicacies. In fact, a locust is a shrimp of the land. And it would make very good into our diet. So why are we not eating insects yet? Well, that's just a matter of mindset. We're not used to it. And we see insects as these organisms that are very different from us. That's why we're changing the perception of insects. And I'm working very hard with my colleague Arnold van Huys in telling people what insects are, what magnificent things they are, what magnificent jobs they do in nature. And in fact, that without insects, we would not be here in this room. Because if the insects die out, we will soon die out as well. If we die out, the insects will continue very happily. So we have to get used to the idea of eating insects. And some might think, well, they're not yet available. Well, they are. <laughs> There's entrepreneurs in the Netherlands that produce them. And one of them is here in the audience, Marjan Peters, who's on the picture. I predict that later this year, you get them in the supermarkets. Not visible, but as animal protein in the food. And maybe by 2020, 
you'll buy them just knowing that this is an insect that you're going to eat. And they're being made in the most wonderful ways. A Dutch chocolate maker. So there's a lot of design to it even. <laughs> well, in the Netherlands, we have an innovative minister of agriculture, and she puts the insect on the menu in her restaurant, in her ministry. And when she got all the ministers of agriculture of the EU over to The Hague recently, <laughs> she went to a high-class restaurant, and they ate insects all together. It's not something that is a hobby of me. It's really taken off ground. So why not eat insects? You should try it yourself. A couple of years ago, we had 1,750 people all together on a square in Wageningen town, and they ate insects at the same moment, and this was still big, big news. I think soon it will not be big news anymore when we all eat insects, because it's just a normal way of doing. So you can try it yourself today, and I would say, enjoy. <laughs> and I'm going to show to Bruno some first tries, and he can have the first bites. <laughs> Look at them first. Look at them first. It's all protein. That's exactly the same you saw in the video, actually, and uh, yeah. it looks delicious. Let's just make it nuts or something. Thank you. Could insects really be the next big culinary thing? I've got to say, the subject bugs me out. Has it really caught on here in New York? Let's dig right in with our guest, award-winning chef and nutritionist, Gina Keatley is with us. And also, we've got Kelly Choi. She is the host of our own NYC Life's Eat Out with Time Out. Kelly, thanks for being Thank here with you. us. Thank you. So let's get right to it. I know both of you are big bug eaters. OK, I'm overdoing it, but you have both eaten insects. So let's start out by talking about what you've had, what it tastes like. Let's get into it. Kelly, you eat for a living. What's I that do. all about? What have you eaten? What bugs? Where? Why? And what do they taste like? Well, you know, I wish I could say that I've had many different kinds of bugs, but um, I've had <laughs> one in particular, being my background is Korean. There is actually a pretty popular snack when you go to the streets of Korea in Seoul. They have these, uh, it's a street food, it's a snack. A lot of students eat them and they're silkworms and they'll be big, huge, like stainless steel round bowls of them on the street. They're kind of like short worms and they taste a bit salty. Uh, it's kind of, it's a popular snack, but it is a bit of a delicacy. That's really kind of the only major one that I've tried. And how about you, Gina? Um, I've worked with several different uh, in insects, so I've, I've eaten mealworms, scorpions, crickets, a variety. A and which are your favorite? <laughs> My favorite have to be mealworms. They are the easiest to prepare, and they don't really have a face, which is <laughs> something that helps. That you does feel help. a little less guilty. Well, I think one of the issues that people don't talk about with bugs is actually how you kill them. You know, when you're preparing them, the crickets jump around, and they can bite you. <laughs> I know, it's disgusting, it's, right? It's not um, easy, I'm sure, to even, when you cooked with crickets, you've cooked with crickets, did you get them live? That's probably the way that is freshest and the best to eat it, right? It definitely is, and you can do several things. You can, uh, can contain them and put them in foil and then freeze them so they're not actually moving during your prep time. Uh, but it is difficult. It's definitely an element of eating bugs that I think people don't talk about. Well, I want to talk <laughs> about, you mentioned Korea. We were going to talk in a few minutes about all the other cultures, and, and Marcel talks in his TED Talk about uh, the fact that we're in the minority here in the West in not eating bugs. Why, Gina, don't we eat more bugs in America? As a chef, I will say because steak tastes better. 
<laughs> That's a matter of opinion, obviously, though, right? Yeah. True, yes. Well, it's also, you know, people are scared. It's something new, and, you know, I deal with people who won't even eat a whole fish, or I'm sure you've had people who don't want to eat shrimp with head on. It's, it's a concept that it's dirty or disgusting. Exactly, yeah. We're but just not used to it. It's not entirely true, right? I mean, he makes the point about the beginning and the end of the food chain. And I think a lot of it is deeply psychological. Part of it, you know, bugs just have, they, they just need a better PR person. They need better publicity, <laughs> really. I mean, Marcel Dico wants to be the PR person for bugs. He's obviously from another part of the world. Where else are, are bugs most popular? I think most bugs, you can eat them readily in Southeast Asia, um, a lot of Africa, and a lot of Latin countries. I mean, um, there are restaurants in New York right now that serve chapulines, which are the, the, gra the grasshoppers, the crickets. I mean, give us a sense for folks who may be intrigued while they're listening to us talk, but need a little more information from you ladies who've had the experience. I think that what you don't realize is that they're going to be very, very crunchy. They're and not the worms, right? Not the they worms, can be very but different. the mealworms do get pretty crunchy, or crickets are crunchy. It's, um, if you're going for more of a scorpion, that's kind of like a uh, soft-shell crab. So it's different varieties taste different, but I, w I would say for the crickets and the mealworms, it's, it's crunchy. It's like grabbing potato chip, throwing one in. Most of the time that I've seen it, it's deep fried. Yeah. And we all know anything that's deep anything fried tastes really good. Fried so, or chocolate right. and you're set. <laughs> so it's probably going to be crunchy by the way that it's prepared. I think worms, depending on um, certain countries, I know, in, I think in Cambodia, they like to f the, the taste and the mouthfeel of like the abdomens of certain tarantulas because it's like creamy tasting. Mm. So depending on the variety, and depending on what we're eating, it can be very different. Now, you mentioned uh, doing battle with a biting cricket, but what about, uh, I, I read when you were on Extreme Chef, there was just the gross-out factor. Getting back to the psychological, uh, not so much for the person eating the bug, but for the person preparing the bug. Say a little bit about that. Oftentimes we are killing things in our kitchens as chefs. So when you have mealworms and you put your hands in the mealworms and they're crawling all over, it's something that oh. it was definitely a memorable <laughs> You're experience. Me, Gina. And I, I have done a lot of, you know, I do a lot of butchering and I'm comfortable with many, many styles of meats. But just the, the feeling of them being alive and then them not is, it's a little bit shocking, but. Um, so how did you get past that? Just Did you get past it? Just kind of <laughs> grinned and bared it. You but dig in. <laughs> you dig, you, you give it a try, and that's what people do in other countries, so we want to kind of respect that culture and try to do what they're doing. But the thing is, I mean, we're focusing right now on the kind of the gross out factor, but I think there's the total opposite, and especially in New York, um, you know, I read about stuff all the time. There are these secret eating societies, and there are dinners that charge like $100 a head, and not only are these secret dinners centering just on bugs, yes prepared by, you know, pretty well-known chefs. Not only are they totally reserved, but you can't even get a space That's for right. it. That's so, right. And yes, sometimes these chefs come from other parts of the country and world to prepare these dinners. And they'll use their techniques and make it different ways and prepare it where you can't necessarily identify it, and sometimes that you can. There is that high sort of ick factor, but then there's the very high cool factor. It's like saying, um, you know, why do we skydive? Why do we bungee jump? Because not many people do it, and it's like, oh, you did that? you actually ate that, like that, that sort of novelty of it is something that when you've done it, you want to share it and you want to tell people that you've done it so that everyone's like, ah, oh, that's so cool. It's like the cool kid factor is really high too. And, and Western cultures eat things that other cultures might find repulsive, frog's legs and shrimp. Not and even, even cow. I mean, in certain yes. parts of India, that's very sacrilegious and Absolutely. that's barbaric. And so that gets back to just the comfort zone, the comfort level. And I would imagine in your work you find uh, sometimes you're looking at a plate and if you can do the disconnect, you realize, oh, well, if I were in another part of the world that I've traveled to, someone might find this very odd or even repulsive. I did a show um, that I was very excited about and I centered the whole show on eggs and all my favorite egg dishes in the city. And um, in the Philippines, there's this balut that's a fermented chicken or duck egg. I wanted to not only experience and taste what other people probably have had, you know, in different parts of the world, but I wanted to be, I wanted to be forced to really try it. And uh, I love any sort of egg and chicken dish. It just tasted like a great chicken soup. But, you know, at the beginning when I looked at this fermented chicken egg, it wasn't like I, I just, I didn't pay much attention to what I was seeing because you can see potentially beak and wing and feathers and stuff like that, but just cracking it open and I, I knew that I wanted to eat it quickly. 
And then later when uh, we had more, they were, we, we boiled like a half a dozen or something. Then I peeled and I actually looked at all the vessels and the blood, you know, the, that kind of stuff. And then it's a little bit of a freak out, but, but it's also kind of like, wow, I did that. It's kind of cool. But you know? you know, all of this gets me to the obvious question that I know folks, some of our viewers are thinking and maybe even right now dashing off their emails, the question of cruelty. You use the word kill at least twice with regard to the bugs. I know you must get this question yourself. You talk about butchering. Now we're on the question of just animals in general. And I've covered this issue of eating bugs before and always get emails and phone calls and comments about insects as living creatures. What about that aspect of it? Gina. Well, they are definitely living creatures, but, <laughs> but I'm a chef, and so I, I'm not a vegan or a vegetarian. I understand that you know, our, most of our society eats meat, and that's a part of my job. Um, and we try to do our best to, to be you know, kind to the animals or insects, but it's, it's part of doing business. But, you know, Marcel brings up a great point in his uh, lecture as well. If we're talking about cruelty to animals, this is a lot less cruel to the environment, and ecologically, it's a lot better, right? It's we're killing, his point. right? I mean, we're killing cows, we're killing chickens in very inhumane, inhumane ways. So, if you compare the two, actually, it's, I don't know. Some people would say it's a lot kinder to be eating and killing bugs. So, do you think it'll catch on here in New York? I think it already has in some circles. Um, to a large degree, it has to be more easily available. Yeah. I can tell you where you can get bugs right now. Tell us. A pet store. Bugs come That's from pet true. stores. Because you, when you're looking at mealworms or crickets, those are things that you would feed to reptiles. So whenever I do prepping of any sort of, you know, or tastings, I'll, I'll hit the pet cow. I'll tell you where else you can get bugs. Right here on our table. Bon appetit. Now, uh, Gina, do you know what we have before us? Do I want to know? You do want to know, because you're eating bugs. That's what's hot. Um, so we have them two different ways. We have them, of course, sweet. So we have them do uh, dipped in chocolate here, white and milk chocolate. And then we have them savory. So we have several different varieties here, and we're right. going to taste it. Some bacon, some, uh, I think, sour cream and onion. So delicious. Look, look, anything in chocolate has to be good. Agreed. Right. Well, I think with these two is that you'll notice that the little legs have been removed. Okay, more, more information <laughs> than I need. Let's smell. <laughs> okay, I'm going for chocolate. I don't really. Oh, I'm totally a savory I can tell girl. Tell you really savory. I'm yeah, wait. Talking. Maybe I'll try. What, what is these? Are these cheddar cheese? <laughs> oh, come on, Gina. You have to Look play at that. Ball. Oh, She's in. Guys, you didn't cheers with me. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that, that one's totally good, looking right? at Another me. One? Don't, oh. don't look. Don't that look. was sour cream and onion. Cheers to bug oh, eating. They, love they each are other. crunchy. Jamie. They're good, right? Well, they're crunchy. <laughs> Anything in chocolate is good by me. Agreed. I cannot thank you ladies enough. Gina Keatley, Kelly Choi, thank you so much for being with us today. And that is our show. Join me next time for more compelling conversation on TED Talks in NYC. We leave you with the tasty bug treats sampled by some of our other TED Show panelists. And thanks for watching. I'm Jamie Floyd. I do this with hesitation because I love crickets. They make such sweet music. I'm going to try a chocolate covered cricket. Mm, surprisingly crunchy on the outside and soft on the inside. Mm. That is very good. Here, would you like one? Crunchy. Tastes like a Kit Kat. You can dip them in chocolate, you can sprinkle them with sugar. I'm just not going to go there. <laughs> it's crunchy. <laughs> and I'm sort of disgusted. <laughs> It's the future. It's pure protein. Were these killed humanely? I will not eat this chocolate-covered worm, and I will not eat the chocolate-covered cricket because I don't know their calorific value. I try to stay kosher. It's a no. <laughs> these are worms? Worms and crickets. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.